Good evening. My name is Molly Anderson, and I'm the executive director at the Nantucket Athenaeum. And I'd like to welcome you to 2019 Geshki Lecture Series. First, just a quick reminder, if everyone would turn off their cell phones, please. Since the founding of the Nantucket Athenaeum in 1834, we've had a tradition of bringing thought leaders to our island, starting with Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Lucretia Mott, Frederick Douglass. And we're very fortunate that through the generosity of Nan and Chuck Geschke, we can continue that tradition into the present. And it, this particular lecture series has been going on since 2005. So it's very fortunate and an honor for me to be able to introduce Nan Geschke, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Nan. <laughs> Welcome, and thanks for joining us this evening with the first of the Geschke Lecture Series for 2019. It's really my pleasure to introduce to you Kara Swisher. She is a leading-edge technology business journalist and co-founder of Recode. Newsweek has called her Silicon Valley's premier journalist. She is considered, though, a really tough interviewer. Swisher graduated from Georgetown's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service with a BS degree in 1984, and in 85 earned an MS in journalism from Columbia. Swisher worked for an alternative newspaper in Washington, D.C., as well as the Washington Post at the beginning of her career. She joined the Wall Street Journal in 1997, working from the paper San Francisco Bureau, writing a column she created called Boomtown that spotlighted companies, personalities, and the culture of Silicon Valley. In 2003, with her colleague Walt Mossberg, she launched the All Things Digital Conference, which later expanded into a daily blog. The conference featured interviews with tech giants such as Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, among others. Well. In 2014, Swisher and Mossberg struck out on their own with the Recode website. Fox Media acquired the website in 2015 and a month later, the two launched Recode Decode, a weekly podcast which features interviews with prominent figures in technology. In 2018, Swisher became a contributing writer for the New York Times opinion section with columns featuring Google and censorship, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg, and inventor Elon Musk. One of Kara's latest opinion columns in the Times talked about electronic scooters as the best way to see Paris. I think we're all anticipating an interesting and enlightening talk tonight entitled, What's Next? The Internet's Latest Iteration. Let's welcome Kara Swisher. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see if I can get... Let me uh, see if I can get this started, what you guys have here. Oh, where'd it go? There we go. I'm going to uh, put up a, um, a slideshow that I just, that I just did. Um, uh, Speaker Pelosi asked me to come and address the uh, House Democrats uh, recently to talk about where tech is going because of all the regulatory issues facing tech going forward, which was a comical experience being in a, a ballroom full of Democrats. Uh, all fighting with each other, which was kind of fun. Um, I was telling um, at dinner tonight that my son said, this is like America in one room, um, which it was, which was great. But this is a presentation I did for them 
uh, where I was talking about some pretty dire things that I see coming. Um, I've covered tech since the early 1990s, uh, first for the Washington Post, then for the Wall Street Journal, and now for Recode and also the New York Times. And I find this to be a really critical and disturbing time uh, for tech. And so I'm going to put this up as a slideshow. Wait one section. Got it. Let's see if I can do this correctly. Um, I may need help up here. Uh, play from start. There we go. There we go. Oh, no, I've got to get you. How do I get it up there? Oh, right. Sorry. I'm going to do that. Sorry. I don't, yeah, I don't use presentations. I just use the Twitter. Um, so here we go. All right. Um, okay, share screen. You're going to see uh, share window, and then let's get to the, You just put it down here. Let's bring that up first. Now you put it down here. Whoa, sorry, you're going to see all my mean notes to Mark Zuckerberg in a second. Here. Where it go? There it goes. That one. It's it was down here. There we go. And then put it into slideshow. All right. Nope, nope. Put it back. No, I know. I'm going to do it. Sorry. All right. And then do it like this. Okay. And then you're also right. Slideshow. Great. Right, right there. there. Right there. Yep. There okay, great. Um, all right. So I, uh, I want to talk, sorry, but by, the reason I was doing this, this is about facial recognition. Um, just recently, I interviewed Andy Jassy, who is head of Amazon Web Services. He's been at Amazon since he was at, at least 12 years old. Um, and I, uh, I, I was talking to him about facial recognition, of which Amazon has a, has a, a product called Recognition. Um, and I, I find it fascinating that they just removed the C from it, but that's a fine if they want to do something like that. But it's a product they're selling to the federal government, possibly including... Um, ICE um, and the Border Patrol. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting to me when I was interviewing him, and I like Andy, I've known him for a long, long time, um, was, was in, during the interview, he talked about not being responsible for the technology that they create, which I had a problem with. Um, I felt it was really important for technologists to understand that. But one of the things he said is if people, one of the problems with recognition, uh, recognition um, was that um, police departments are misusing it. Um, and when they put in members of Congress who are people of color, members of Congress who are people of color, they match them as criminals, every single person who was, now that may be true, uh, but, uh, but what was really interesting was that they, they, this re facial recognition technology is really flawed, uh, really badly flawed. And even the people that are making it from the start, uh, don't recommend the police departments use it because they are discriminatory by nature, the, 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 the recognition, because of the data going in is bad data. And if bad data goes in, bad data comes out. Um, but the, the person in charge of this, and Amazon, which, which is selling it to governments worldwide, including uh, dozens of police departments, uh, thought it was fine to put out this, this product without, uh, without being... Uh, it being working correctly um, and, and, and putting the onus on the people who are using it, some, of, some departments of which need great reforms. And so I just, I sort of got the idea of, of a reckoning, the idea of that a lot of what technology is putting out needs a reckoning. And so I started to think about what that was because the people I cover and have covered for the past 25 years, which is primarily the original internet people and more, really have uh, taken all the um, money, they've taken all the power, They've taken all the, um, the acclaim and almost none of the responsibility for what they've invented. And so it's, it's, it, this is someone who's covered them for years. Uh, this is a group of people who are in desperate need of regulation and in desperate need of a throttling back and a reckoning uh, for what they've created because the damage they're doing to society is really quite uh, vast. Um, I think today the Washington Post and then the New York Times had a big story about uh, about uh, ICE and, and FBI using uh, driver's license uh, databases throughout this country and applying facial recognition to it uh, without the consent of any of you. Um, you are now in a facial recognition program by the FBI having done nothing, having committed no crime, um, and you're in a database uh, without, uh, and being used in a w advanced technologies without your permission, which I think is a problem in the United States of America. It might be fine in China, it's not fine here. So let's talk about this. I don't know how this goes forward. Let's just use it here. Um, what I want to, I don't know how to get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. Let's see if we can get rid of that. Okay. 
Um, I want to talk first about the idea of human downgrading. This is a concept that Tristan Harris, who's at the Center for Humane Technology, Tristan was a, was a, um, a, a, a an, a, an entrepreneur, a techie. He sold his company to Google. It was an advertising-based company for quite a lot of money, and he started working at Google. And the problem is when he got there, when he was within the Google machine and the advertising machine, he started to realize uh, that it was doing things that were and were, not, uh, were not thinking really hard about consequences and what they would do, including um, he initially started talking about the addictive nature of technology, um, which he wrote a lot about, but he was talking about the, how the whole system is, is des- designed to addict you to keep you involved in it, to enrage you, to, to make you twitchy, to make uh, humans just less than themselves. And the technology does it really well in a, in a manner similar to cigarettes, um, but much more damaging in many ways. And so th- this is what he talked about. It's sort of a civilizational moment when an intelligent species, us, we produce a technology where the technology can simulate the weaknesses of the creator. It's almost like a puppet that we've created can actually simulate a version of its creator and know exactly what puppet strings to pull on the creator so we're all outraged. With increasingly powerful AI, that's artificial intelligence, pointed at your brain to reverse engineer what I can throw in front of you of your nervous system to crawl down your brainstorm and get something out of you, whether that's an ad click or an addiction or a political convergence or whatever. This is all part of one connected system. We call it human downgrading, which is the social climate change of our culture. I thought that was really a strong term to do, but the idea of human downgrading as we're upgrading our technology is a really important one to think about uh, because the creators uh, soon lose control of the system. So let me talk about the key trends you have to be thinking of. If in the past 20 years, it's been an astonishing um, uh, revolution of technology. The stuff that's come out in the past 20 years the, from uh, just every single part of it is, is amazing, most especially around the mobile phone. I think that's really the most important development of the past 10, 15 years. Um, everything you've seen so far is tiny compared to what's coming, what's coming in technology and the, and, the, and the things that are happening. And I think if you think of just the short amount of time that we've moved, uh, our entertainment industry has been devastated and changed, our music industry, our mapping industry, our libraries, ev- our government, everything else, what's happening next is quantumly larger. And you have to think of the key trends going forward, which is now being worked on by a variety of Silicon Valley companies, almost none of which have any regulation. In fact, none of them do. Um, and almost none of which um, are, 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 have any um, ability to stop them for, for any reasons. They're not, they're not accountable to anybody, but really the press, essentially. And here are the key trends. Artificial intelligence, robotics and automation, Self-driving, which is changes in transportation, endless choice, privacy under assault, especially when data is gold. That's the concept that you are the actual product and the fuel of this, and your data is the fuel. Uh, Continuous partial hacking, which is the state we're in right now of being hacked almost continually by foreign bodies, by advertisers, by all kinds of different people. Um, and not most of which have malevolent intent. Continuous partial attention, which is a state that you need to stay in to be part of this. It leads to political and social unrest. And the most important thing is that tech does not do consequences. Um, Adults do consequences. Silicon Valley does not believe in them. This is the first concept, is the BuzzFeed. Uh, It'll buzz your feed. You may read BuzzFeed, you may not. Um, But I thought this was a really, this was right at the beginning of a lot of this when I started really paying attention to it as I was covering it. Um, This was a a BuzzFeed story. If you remember, this was many, many Super Bowls ago. Katy Perry danced with some sharks. Do you remember that? The left shark had a problem with keeping in tune. Fine. It was a a two-second story. BuzzFeed, which was a new kind of media company, which was trying to sort of figure out exactly what would work with you. This is just a partial version. This was a four-minute event on the Super Bowl. They did 62 stories on the shark. And you know why? They were trying to figure out which ones you would like. They were trying to figure out which ones you'd respond to, which ones you would click on, which headlines would work, so they could teach the computers to know what they should write about. This was media by computer. And so I was really fascinated because it was such a stupid event. It was, but one of the things was that my favorite was the 23 most important moments in left shark history. 
This is four minutes. <laughs> there were not 23 important moments. 15 time, you were the Sharks from Katy Perry's Super Bowl performance. Katy Perry's Sharks were the best part of the Super Bowl show. That was, in fact, true. Uh, the guy who was one of Katy Perry's dancing sharks is actually very hot. Um, which Katy Perry halftime show shark are you? That was a poll. Um, here's what Twitter thought about Katy Perry's shark. This went on and on and on. And I was riveted to this, like that they were doing this. But what they were doing was A-B testing humanity who was watching it to see what they would do and what they would react to. And what they did is they had a crew of the, a bunch of millennials who just sat there and made this content for them. And then the computers would say which one worked. And I thought that was a really interesting thing because... That was not the way I had learned to do media. We learned to do media based on what was important and what were the focus. This was creating a twitchy, twitchy media consumer who just twitches from thing to thing and is reacted either by colors or by, um, or, or the way it, the, the words put together or something else. But it's, a, it's an idea of, uh, of virality and engagement being more important than correctness and context. I believe in correctness and context. This was a very different media landscape, which is, keeps you in a buzzed state of mind. You have to think about what that does. You don't even realize it's happening to you, but the computers do, and they just continually learn and relearn about what works best with you, bringing us down to the lowest common denominator, which leads to not so great things. This is, it will be ubiquitous. Um, one of the things that's important about what's coming is the ubiquity of everything, that it will be all around you, it will be all encompassing. It will be with sensors, it'll be with phones. It, as anyone knows, walking down the street here, I almost ran over at least 14 millennials, and I considered it briefly, um, who were looking at their phones, um, who were looking at their phones and staring at them. It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere you are, it's every part of you. It's also now in your homes with Google Nest, uh, or whatever, Nest, whatever, whoever makes them. I don't put any of them in my house, and you shouldn't either. Um, with sensors, with constant um, buzzing of you, the constant, the constant need to look at it. This is the original one on the left here is Google Glass, which was the first iteration of Google Glass, which nobody really liked, but conceptually it's a very important idea of, of a heads-up display that everyone will have someday. It's just because that particular iteration and execution was terrible, it rendered, one of the problems with Google Glass is everyone looked extraordinarily unattractive wearing it, and therefore the human race wouldn't continue to procreate and therefore it wouldn't work. And so there wouldn't be custom. That was my argument to Sergey Brin, who, found, who was behind it. He didn't think that was very funny. I thought it was hysterical. This is from uh, Clockwork Orange, that it's always making you look, but it really does uh, uh, make you uh, look all the time. Uh, so it has to be ubiquitous. It has to be everywhere. It has to be constantly pinging you to work. It will never turn off. This is, it will never turn off. It doesn't turn off ever. It is constantly on. That's a critical part of the technologies that come is they're not just all encompassing and everywhere. They have to always be on so that you're constantly paying attention to them. Um, I, you know, anyone who has a teenager, I have two, knows this when they're saying, mom, just a second, I just need to look at this when they're looking at their phone. I'm like, it doesn't end. There's no end to it. You can put your face up because it never turns off. It never stops. It always goes to a next thing. And it was designed that way. It's designed that way to do this. And the new technologies, Facebook, Twitter, the rest is designed to continue to, to constantly be transmitting. Is always transmitting. This was something that was on a, a, a thing called Whisper years ago, a, a, a website that didn't really work, people just telling on each other. Um, but this was funny. Uh, this guy was actually tweeting, essentially tweeting from a bathroom stall about someone who, who was on their phone in the bathroom. And I was like, why are you on your phone in the bathroom tweeting about someone who's on their phone in the bathroom? But it's always, the concept was it's always transmitting. It's never, you never can't do anything. You can't walk past a beautiful vista without taking a picture of it and do Instagramming it or tweeting it or sharing it or anything else. And it, it, it's created to make you do that or make you want to do that because it's appealing to all kinds of human instincts to want to share. But, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it, it, it feeds into our, our, our Neanderthal brain that way. Um, the need for speed, it always has to be going faster and faster and faster. So you feel like you're in a constant state of being behind, of news. Um, at the beginning of the Trump administration, I literally couldn't take a shower because I'm like, what did he do now? Like, <laughs> did he close the Supreme Court? No, not yet, soon. Um, but it was like, it's, a con it's, it, it's, it's, it's based on a constant need for speed. And Trump, as you'll see, I'm writing actually a column tomorrow for the Times about this. Um, Twitter is, of course, his favorite medium because it's constant and it's 
twitchy and it's fast and it makes it creates outrage and anger and response and calm response. So it's perfect for for him uh, because it makes you forget the last 53 egregious things that happened and you're you're moving on to the next one and you stay in a constant state of anger. Um, but it needs to be fast. It needs to be fast. It needs speed is an important part of this 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 new uh, uh, media environment. Continuous partial attention, you're just paying attention some of the time, but you're never not paying attention to it. It never moves away from you. So a state of continuous partial attention means you cannot have long thoughts. You cannot have thoughtful thoughts. You cannot have a sustained conversation. It's hard to listen to things. It's hard to read books. Um, When you're in a state of continuous partial attention, you feel like you're missing out. It's sort of a version of FOMO, but a digital version of FOMO, which is fear of missing out. Um, And it keeps, it, it does something to your cerebral cortex to be constantly paying attention to something, having something at your side, um, having it buzzing at you, having the need to look at it. I think anyone who has a phone knows uh, that it's really hard to not pick it up. It's super hard not to pick it up. Um, it will be political. It be, Sorry, just any picture of Trump looks terrible. So um, uh, it will be political, and it's designed to be political. It's political response to all this stuff. It's not, poli- it's not policy. It's about politics, not policy. Policy is something that takes thought and takes careful consideration. Politics is this. This is what politics does. And so it becomes more and more political. It's, it, everyone's like, I can't believe the partisanship. I'm like, I can't believe it's not more partisan, given all these elements Um, that are here to create a very political, polarized experience that everybody has. And so you can't have a thoughtful discussion. You just say, you're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. And it it works really well in that function. Um, It will make you expose yourself. You become the fodder for this. This is another text. Have you ever taken a note? Of course everyone has. But but it's not everyone. I I, I speak only for myself. Um, So uh, it will make you expose yourself. You want to to become the fodder. You want to expose yourself. You want to talk. Um, There's nothing private. It makes you feel that privacy is not the normal state of things. It makes you feel like you should be sharing when others are sharing. So again, it has this element of exposition. So here's the, here's the main technologies will happen now with all these things having happened. And these have all happened already. And we're already in this state. We, all, we live in this world. We breathe in this world. These are the new things that are going to be, take this and turbocharge it in a way that I think people don't quite understand. The first is AI. This is a sentence I say constantly. I say it everywhere I go so people will get it through their brains. Anything that can be digitized will be digitized. Any job any piece of content, any thought, anything can be digitized. That is massive. First, we thought about uh, jobs, and you can think of lots of jobs that are digitizable. Like, there's a lot of music jobs. There's a lot of, uh, there's all kinds of jobs that have been digitized um, that we no longer, like, who who used to make uh, pay phones? They don't make them anymore. Nobody makes pay phones anymore. What happened to those people? I don't know, but their jobs were digitized because of the cell phone. And it, everything gets, of course, it was replaced by these, but eventually it just, it const, it's a constant um, sort of Borg-like structure where it eats up anything that is digitizable. Right now, it's been a small amount of jobs. Going forward, there's lots and lots of jobs with AI that creates this. Lawyers. Lawyers are a very digitizable job. A lot of what they do is patterns, and you don't need to have anything creative involved. A lot of it is citing. The only part of it is the, cre- the creative part of arguing. But at some point, AI can figure this out too. Uh, accountants, like you start to start to go work through it. Doctors, there's all kinds of medical uh, procedures that do not need uh, doctors. Radiologists, for example, if your kid wants to be a radiologist, I'd advise against it. It doesn't. They aren't going to need radiologists anymore because computers are smarter. Uh, than people at this. They can go through thousands and thousands of, of uh, screens of, of uh, information instantly, the way people can. And, they, and they're right most of the time, almost all the time, I think. Um, so massive job disruption comes with everything being digitized. That means people have to have multiple careers throughout their lifestyle. They have to, throughout their life, excuse me. They have to have multiple careers. They have to constantly be moving jobs as things become digitized. This weekend I was in Vermont. Um, I said I was trapped in a Vermont ad 
uh, because there were like cows and there was cheese. And it was, I was like, this is like too much for me. And no phone access, which of course for me was horrible. Um, but one of the, one of the things I was in a blacksmith shop, of course, they always show you the blacksmith shop and do a little presentation of blacksmithing. Um, and I just kept thinking, ah, this job was totally changed. Like, you know what I mean? Like what happened to these people? Well, they didn't need them because of manufacturing, because of all kinds of things. And this was a job that was disrupted, but lots of people did it. The same thing with, uh, farm to manufacture, all the farm to manufacturing jobs. They were disrupted and completely eliminated for the most part uh, over time. Um, and so it's the same thing that's going to happen with, 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 uh, with AI as it moves forward. That means people will be in a gig economy. I think we all know what a gig is. Not just an Uber driver, but everyone will be an Uber driver. It'll be a, that'll be the kind of thing. And that brings in big questions about health care, what follows you, benefits, and things like that. It requires the need for massive reschooling of people because a lot of the way they teach us now, the way they've taught us is not applicable in this economy. And that means a lot of people in schools now aren't, uh, aren't, aren't being schooled properly for what's coming. Um, it becomes smarter and we become dumber. It's just the way it is. As more data goes into these systems, they get better and better at it. This is not computing in the old way. This is computing that learns and relearns and then teaches itself. Um, and so it does become smarter. It does make better decisions. A lot of people tend to look at it like a, a Terminator-like fate for humanity, but actually I did a really great interview with Elon Musk that I urge you to listen to. As crazy as he is, he's very smart. Um, that uh, about how he looks at it and he thinks that he's been fighting against AI in lots of ways and funding a lot of things for open AI and things like that. Um, because he thinks eventually you're gonna, it's going to run everything. This AI is going to make all decisions for us. Um, and I said, well, is that like the Terminator thing or will it, it kill us? And he was like, why would it kill us? We were pointless to being killed. There's no reason to kill us. Actually, they, it would treat us like a house cat. Like, we're, we're like a house cat. Like, would you kill the house cat? No, not really. It's fine. Um, or actually, recently, he's sort of read, I just saw him recently, and he said, actually, it's more like, you know how you build a highway and there's a bunch of ants in the way? You go over them, but you don't think about them. You just go over them. Like, you might go over them, you might not go over them, but that's how it's going to be. Like, it's not going to be anything like that. His suggestion, of course, is that we all put chips in our brains and fight them, but that's <laughs> not my plan. Anyway, um, uh, but it can't fix the problem, which is that, uh, that it's coming, and it's better, and it, it does work better. It's like, it's, you know, butter churns were great, but they aren't as good as the way we make butter now. So it's just that's the way it's going. Um, the, the, getting to that, the robots are not killers. They don't have to kill us to win. That's the increasing replacement of all repetitive jobs, every one of them, mining, manufacturing, transportation. I always, every time Trump would go, coal miners, I'm going to bring your jobs back. I'm like, totally, you're not going to get your jobs back ever because people shouldn't coal mine. Guess what? It's dangerous. Guess what? Humans don't do it as well as machines. They're doing uh, mining. Uh, robots are doing mining in lots of places that, and works much better. And by the way, every person who owns a coal company is going to replace people with machines in a New York minute when they all, all those people who say they're trying to return these jobs are just not going to. It, it's cheaper. There's going to be specific robots, food, laundry, dishwashing. Right now in San Francisco, we have a, co a robot coffee maker. It makes pretty good coffee. We got a robot uh, a hamburger flipper company where you, it works really well. The problem is it's super expensive right now, but event, and, it, and people are cheaper, actually. Hamburger flippers are cheaper, so we're going to keep using people hamburger flippers until we figure out the robot hamburger flippers. But eventually the robots will do a better job. They just will. Um, and so we're going to see specific robots in every single area. Um, but what's important about to remember this is human creativity can't be replicated. It's really hard for computers to be creative. And so the jobs you have to think about are jobs that are creative, that require creativity. Um, and so any, any part that, it, that requires any kind of creativity is very hard for robots or, or AI to replicate. Um, so you have to think really hard about what those jobs are. Um, and it's not just artists. There's lots of jobs. You know, uh, d doctors can, are, may not be diagnosing, but care is a very human thing. Care is a very human thing. Um, so in that area, the job of a doctor can change from diagnostics, which takes up a lot of their time, and they're not usually very good at most of the time, um, and, and computers will be much better, um, to other ways to care for people and figuring out stuff. There's all kinds of jobs that you can, you can figure out new ways uh, to do things with human creativity. Um, one of the things that's kept uh, people in mind is robots being, wanting to make robots more human. Actually, what I think is going to be happening is humans are going to become more robotic. We're going to start having more things on our bodies, more uh, accessories, better hearing, better eyesight, 
Um, there's all these ectoskeletons being used by the, by the military now, which allows you to pick up a car. You know, you put it on and you can be like bionic. Um, that kind of stuff is you're going to see much more than making robots more human. It's really hard to make robots human. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the picture of the robot opening the door. You know, the, you've ever seen that picture from Boston Dynamics where the robot opens the door and everyone's like, oh, it opened the door. I'm like, my, my kid was two, he could open a door. Like, it's not really the biggest thing. They're not going to move very fast in robotics. It's very difficult to even get them to walk. Um, and so you're going to see more of a humans becoming robotic than robots becoming human. But if we get to the point where we do have cyborgs and things like that, we're going to have to question whether they want to have rights because well, they will be in a, in, of a format, a sentient being. And so we have to think about that. It's something Bill Gates has talked about. One of the things to keep in mind with both AI and robotics is China is winning on all of these things, making huge investments in education, in, in uh, regular investments in these companies. They're really doing a, an astonishing job of, of um, moving forward past the U.S. and all these things. Um, right now, our country doesn't have a chief science officer and hasn't had one for several years. Um, China is, it's astonishing. Um, of all the many things that are problematic right now, the lack of focus on science and engineering and investments in this area is really quite startling. Um, of the many startling things. Um, I used to be married to the person who was the chief technology officer for the United States. And uh, I, they had the Ebola crisis then. And it was critically important that our science officers were there advising the president on things around, um, around Ebola. Um, and, uh, and we don't have any of those people in place right now in the, fe in the federal government system. There's nobody um, who has any science background advising uh, President Trump. I don't know if it would work, but there isn't anybody, so it's even more problematic. Um, the next issue is privacy. There is no uh, privacy. Um, there, there, there still is no privacy. There's a famous quote by Scott McNeely, there is no privacy, get used to it. It's still the same thing. Scott is, is been, was right then, and he's right now. Um, that brings in, I'm going to go through these really quickly, the Facebook conundrum, and that we, we sort of give up all our information to Facebook, and it takes it and uses it for its own purpose. Um, one of the things that's been uh, problematic for, for this country is there, there is, when I say it's not about the terms of service, everybody tends to focus on it, but that there are not laws in place. There's not a national privacy law in this country. There are privacy laws all across the country. There's one in California that's about to get into place. There's 10 to 12 states working on privacy bills, but there's no national privacy bill. In fact, there's no legislation uh, over any tech companies in existence right now. And in fact, it's worse than that. They have a thing called Section 230, which was a really important uh, way to get these technology companies up and going. Um, it gives them broad immunity for everything they do. Um, so they get broad immunity for whatever whatever happens on Facebook. They're not responsible for it. It's, it's in law right now. Um, it's very good for some reasons. It's very bad for others. But in the existence of a lack of any regulation, you get what you got. For the most part, Congress has been useless in the privacy fight. Um, nobody has put up a bill, um, especially because no one can agree on what privacy is and what rights you should have. I think there is still no privacy, but you certainly have rights to the use of your, of your data. And I think that's where we have to get in on the fact that privacy doesn't exist, but you do have rights over how your data is used and what the data that you generate. Um, one of the things that happens in this kind of environment is it's a never ending revolution. Populism and nativism increases globally, as you've seen that. The lack of unity makes marketing to many harder, not just marketing, but governing. Um, I, I, this is, I'm not gonna talk about Patagonia, but there's, you'll see, you'll, you'll see an increasing uh, impact of all of this on, on, on retail, on business, and all ev everybody else. You just saw it recently uh, with Nike over Colin Kaepernick. Um, it's just, it's just, it creates, it creates a really uh, fraught situation for businesses to operate in because they're constantly reacting to things. Um, and as you, as you have, uh, as you have to, you sort of become a brand. I was using the brand of Patagonia for a certain group of people versus another group of people. There's no unifying brand for everyone. Everyone, you just saw Starbucks getting messed up, getting sort of wrapped around the axle, around the police officer was there. It was instantly. It happened instantly. It went global. It, nobody can deal with anything thoughtfully. Um, and companies screw up, which they often do. Um, there's a book by Jaron Lanier uh, about social media. He's a really great technologist. Um, and he, he said to me, the internet is the largest social experiment on humanity, and it's not working. 
Um, it's the largest social experiment of people talking to people. The idea behind it was that people would be able to talk to each other and become better for it, become more tolerant, become more sharing in good ways. And what's happened is it's generated, unfortunately, into a very different thing um, uh, than it, it had been intended, which is the law of consequences. And so in that way, a lot of the forces of evil, Russia, Iran, China, I don't want to say China's the forces of evil, but these these... Russia, I will say, is the forces of evil, um, are using this opportunity to take advantage of our open, uh, pluralistic society in that these tools that we invented, the Americans invented, it was invented here, um, they're taking them and using them to their advantage. Russia lost the Cold War. It is winning this one. Um, I, I know there's a lot of debate around the election and who won the election, but there, there's absolutely no question by everybody who's slight, even slightly looked at any of the data that the Russians really really did manipulate this election in all kinds of different ways, none of which we're ever going to be able to prove, which is the entire point of it. It makes us doubt ourselves and say that couldn't be. They absolutely were deeply engaged in trying to throw the election. And we will never know which part of it worked. We will never know uh, what, what did work, what didn't work. And they're doing it again today. And they continue to do it because guess what? It works. And, and the, the companies that are left to, to fight it, Facebook, Google, YouTube and others um, are fighting nation states. And they also do not have any of the incentives necessary to stop doing what they're already doing or to redesign their systems because their systems are designed to operate this way. A lot of the people were talking about the Russian influence on the elections and on politics globally. And one of the things I always like to say is that Russia did not hack Facebook, it was a customer of Facebook. It used it exactly the way it was created, and that's why they got such good res results they wanted um, in some way. And we have to be very careful what they're going to do next, especially around deep fakes, which are videos that look really quite real, um, and even just r regular fake fakes, just the recent video of Nancy Pelosi. I wrote a pretty good column on that in The Times, uh, where they, show, they, they slowed down the video to make her look drunk, and it went around the internet. Lots of people thought she was a drunk. She is not a drunk. Um, but, it, you know, and then Facebook declined to take it down. Uh, instead decided just to label it as everyone thinks this is fake, but we're leaving it up anyway because you deserve to see it, um, which was an astonishing decision by them. Um, I think that's why I get to this idea is nobody is responsible. Um, and this is something Tristan said, if your platform doesn't hold people accountable to the rules, then your rules really don't have much meaning. You see not just on Reddit, but on Twitter, where people are allowed to break rules because of newsworthiness, which is very vague. People don't know what it actually means, and you end up with more and more vitriol. The problem we have now with Silicon Valley, because they aren't making rules, is that uh, they, they won't make rules, they won't take responsibility, and therefore it is... Um, I like to liken it to uh, they own a, a city. They've created a city, a big, giant city, which they're collecting all the rents on, but have no police force, no garbage, no street signs, no, uh, no uh, anybody watching the buildings and whether they're safe or not, no safety regulations. And I call it the purge every night. They've left humanity in a purge-like situation where they, are, they have and run these big platforms of which there are no rules. Um, and they d decline for lots of different reasons, most of which are pretty lame, to do anything about it. Um, and so the question is, what are we gonna do? Because one of the things that's important to remember is that it is linked. This is all linked. It's not just about addiction. It's not just about polarization. It's not just about uh, uh, screens uh, hurting the way we think. It's not just about, it is all linked in one great thing. And this is what Tristan talked about. The whole point of this big new agenda we're launching, the humane agenda, is to say we need to move from disconnected set of grievances and scandals that these problems are seemingly separate. Tech addiction, polarization, outrageification of culture, the rise in vanities, micro-celebrity culture. Everyone has to be famous. These are not separate problems. They're all coming together in one thing, which is the race to capture humans, at human attention by the tech giants. And what happens, I think, that you should understand is that it ends up in ugliness if we don't take some control of it. The problem of human downgrading, which I talked about at the beginning, we've been upgrading the machines, we've been downgrading humans, downgrading our attention spans, downgrading our civility, our decency, downgrading democracy for sure, downgrading mental health. When you really examine the full surface of harms, 
polarization, radicalization, outrageification culture, call out culture, groups being marginalized, people feeling threatened and trolled. These are direct consequences, the race to get attention. They are direct consequences of the technology because the stuff that's best at getting attention, it turns out. Let me give you an example with outrage. For each word of moral outrage that you add to a tweet, it increases your retweet rate by 17%. Outrage is good business for these people, and they've been benefiting for far too long and need more people to fix it. And it is fixable. Like climate change, it can be catastrophic. Unlike climate change, it's only about 1,000 people among five companies that need to change what they're doing. So it's really important for us as citizens, as journalists, as uh, polit the politicians that are supposed to serve you, to understand that this is easily fixable if we begin to start to think about what are the smart regulations, what are the smart things they need to do. This does not mean not creating an innovative culture. Innovation is the, is the key, is key to our country and keeping us ahead of all these other countries which have really problematic cultures. China is a surveillance economy. Russia is the mafia. It really truly is. It is run like a mafia uh, organization. We have the best country on earth. We have the best innovations. We created the most innovation. And what's happening is five companies that have far too much power are not allowing the 500 companies that should exist to do so. When these companies are trillion dollar companies, there is no innovation that is going to happen. There, is ne there has not been a social network since 2011 created. There hasn't been a search network for two, 15 years. There's been no search company created for first years. And so I do think really hard about the idea of, uh, of, of what we do when this happens, is that if only a small group of people are controlling our most important assets, which is innovation, we are not going to do well as a society, as, as, a, as a democratic society. And it's really important for us to think hard about that and to promote innovation, to promote the lack of bigness. It is not, it is not bad for companies to be successful. What it is is for them to block innovation, is to block new ideas and, and fresh new things. And even though it's super controversial, Elizabeth Warren has a thing of break up the tech companies. Some of it's a little bit using a hammer to, you know, just using a hammer on something that's much more delicate. But the concept is, is if you, anytime you break up big things, it results in innovation, AT&T, um, IBM, there's all kinds of examples of innovation following the breakup of too much power and allowing lots of things to happen and to focus in on education, on the idea that we need to, we want, we need to train our young people to be more entrepreneurial, the idea that they have opportunity um, that doesn't just, uh, that, that, that isn't limited to them. The idea that there should be opportunity for everyone, which means a diverse culture. And that's the most important thing I'll end on. Um, one of the things I think about a lot, there's a lot of debate in Silicon Valley about diversity and the lack of diversity. The reason we are where we are is because it is a homogeneous leadership culture. It is a culture, the reason Twitter is so bullying is because the people who created it have never been unsafe a day in their lives. They don't even understand what it's like. Um, and so what's really important is to get as many points of view, and not just, not just uh, race, not just, uh, not just gender, but age uh, of, of experience, of all kinds of things. The very best of our cultures uh, combining is the way you get to the future. And diversity uh, among the people who create this stuff is critically important because what's, what's happening is not a, a, it's not a problem of talent. There is talent all over this globe. There's talent all over this country. It's everywhere. It's not just in Silicon Valley. It is absolutely not just in Silicon Valley. What there is, though, is a real problem with opportunity. And if we don't give opportunity to as many people as possible, we're not going to come up with the really big problems we face going forward, including climate change, which is, you, you can see it on this island, you can see it everywhere. Washington, D.C. is now flooded, for example. We have to figure out how we're going to deal with some of these massive issues, which the only, thing, the only way we're going to solve them is through technology. And so it's critically important that we bring our best minds, our many minds, our very different minds to bear on it. And now I will answer, after I direly talked about this, please <laughs> ask any questions you like. And yes, Mark Zuckerberg is a very nice person. <laughs> he is. So, questions from the audience. If we got some time, yeah. How did the uh, Democrats in Congress respond to this? Uh, interesting. It was interesting. You know, I, I've been talking to a lot of Congress people. I've been spending a lot of time trying to educate them, and there's some very good. I know you. I don't know how many of you saw the Mark Zuckerberg hearings. 
it would seem like they were all idiots in Congress, right? From that, it was sort of like, Mr. Zuckerberg, you're so smart. Um, it was weird, but uh, it's, they're very, they're open to it on both sides of the aisle of all things. You know, there's some really, there's, I hate to say on both sides now, that's been ruined for us for eternity, but um, I, there's a lot of people in Congress, especially uh, in the Senate, who really do understand this issue. Uh, I would say uh, Senator Warner, um, I would say uh, Senator, uh, Senator Klobuchar, um, there's, there's a bunch of them that really do understand what's, Senator Bennett from Colorado, he's running, he's one of the 53 people running for president, he's wonderful actually, um, he's wonderful, he's really amazing actually, a great thinker, a smart guy. Um, there's a lot of people who do understand uh, what needs to be done, I, I'll name a Republican, Will Hurd from Texas is really smart on these issues, very reasonable. Um, so I think they do hear it. I think I, I'm, the reticence to, 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 um, to not do any legislation is because they're scared of ruining the innovation. But the fact of the matter is the innovation has suffered. There hasn't been new startups in this. this we're at the low point of new startups right now um, in 30 years, something like that. There's some number that's really amazing. And there hasn't been a fresh new startup in Silicon Valley for a while. Like if you, you can't name a new fresh company in Silicon Valley right now or a crop of them. You know, there was the Uber, Pinterest, Airbnb group, but that was 10 years ago. It was almost 10 years ago. Um, so you can't, and again, if you look at a lot of the areas, uh, you can't find it, but they've been pretty good. They've been, they can do it. They're capable of doing it. But then Google and Facebook and others have hiring enormous lobbying organizations. Uh, so that's one of the issues, of course. Um, so we'll see. We'll see if they're as good as other horrible giant companies are doing that. Go ahead. You named five companies. You right. said there were five companies that were too big. Yeah. What are they? Uh, I think the two critical ones are Facebook and Google in terms of, of, their, of their power, of their market share. Google now has, what is it, 90-some percent of the search market. They keep one or two people in business just to as a fig leaf uh, to legislators. But uh, I would say Google, uh, I ranked them Google, Facebook, Amazon. And then the other two that we have to think about legislation around is probably Apple and um, uh, Microsoft. You know, Microsoft, which used to be the most evil company in the world, is now not at all. Um, uh, but you have to, I think Microsoft is not in that group. So the fifth would, might be, um, I guess there are four. Twitter. Twitter is not that big. It's influential. It's influential. So you have to think about legislation around them. I mean, like Apple, for example, the app store is controversial. It doesn't need to be broken up. It needs to have legislation, smart legislation around pricing on that stuff. And that's easily fixed. I don't think Apple needs to be broken up at all, but I do think pulling some stuff off of Google it might work. YouTube off of Google would be an interesting thing. Uh, yeah, recently, I think Yeah. They're not random at all. Well, I think what they were talking about is how you can influence people. By, he, she was talking about Google search results and how they they're come. They're, the, the concept behind Google was paths are made by walking. Everyone searches them, and therefore, that's what you get. But have you ever seen the fill-in thing? Um, watch that carefully. Do women are. See what you get. Evil is the first thing that you get, just so you know. Right. And gives you the results that the algorithm thinks, thinks that you want. Yeah. Right, right. And so the issue is if people are searching for something, then you get more of that kind of stuff like that. And I think one of the problems is that you have given, Google is now the de facto brain of humanity at this point, right? Well, there's, I just did a podcast with Gabe Weinberg, who runs DuckDuckGo. One of the issues around all these companies are, is the business models of them. They work, the, the, they've made a lot of money on, um, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but behavioral advertising versus um, the other kind. I'm, I, I literally know this like the back of my hand, but right now I'm blanking. Contextual advertising. Contextual advertising is fine. I'm searching for a refrigerator. Here are refrigerator ads, like that kind of thing. Behavioral advertising takes a lot of information about you, other stuff from you on the, 
they don't need to do behavioral advertising. It's just faster and more lucrative. But contextual advertising, which Gabe does at DuckDuckGo, is pretty simple and straightforward. You get what you're searching for. And so the question is, should they be allowed to be doing the behavioral advertising in the way that they're doing it? And I think Cambridge Analytica was the perfect example of using behavioral advertising to, to modify people's feelings about whatever and trying out different things. I just did a very good uh, podcast today with, uh, with Carol Cadwallader, who broke the stories of Cambridge Analytica for The Guardian in England. Um, you, might, you might get some thoughts on that, but how? But how, but the idea of f- the business models of Facebook and Google are behavioral advertising, pretty much. They don't have to be. They can. They don't need to put together that much information um, and and use it the way they do. There's other business models that are just as lucrative. They just haven't been spending their money on it because this is easy pickings um, to do that. And then they mix. It, in Facebook's case, they mix it with. Uh, other there's tons and tons of behavioral stuff going on from lots of companies you've never heard of, like Axiom and some others. But they marry it all together, and it creates a real, um, you know, it creates a great business, great business model. The dark web, meaning the drug stuff. Anonymous, anonymous. anonymous searching. Anonymous there's, there is anonymous browsing. You can do private browsing or just, you can do, uh, oh yes, that's typically used for, um, uh, I'm not an expert in this area, but it's typically used for nefarious things. They're usually, they usually used for, well, there's a, there's, there's a version of private, for example, on the Safari browser that you can use so that your brow, there's all kinds of things you can add to your browsers that I would never use a Google browser. Trust me. I wouldn't use it. There's no way in the world I would turn on my information on the Google browser. I use Safari. Um, Sometimes I use DuckDuckGo for search. Um, I think, yes, presumably, yes, you really could hide yourself on these things. The problem is most of them are used by criminals in order to hide or pornographers or pedophiles. And so not really something I want. There's plenty of stuff you can do now to protect yourself from a privacy point of view. Um, so that you don't uh, that you don't get tracked. There's all kinds of things like that. We don't have basic do not track legislation, you know, around this. Like for example, I have me and Mark Zuckerberg have this on our cameras. This is a little thing. You can open it and put the camera in. I cover up my uh, the, my mic. Mark does the same thing. Mark Zuckerberg's covering up his mic and his camera. You might want to think about it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Um, but there's plenty of stuff you can do. There's plenty of stuff you can do and use. I, DuckDuckGo is an excellent search engine. Um, I don't turn on mapping where I am. I don't let Google collect my mapping information. Uh, I, I, I worry that, that Uber has so much of it, for example. Uh, but there's all kinds of things. The problem is you have to do it versus, you know, versus they have to do it. And one of the things that I always think about is like, you don't, except if you live in Flint, you don't worry about clean water. So the government takes care of it. The government should be legislating people not to follow you without your specific consent, and that you don't have. So it should be opt-in versus opt-out. And right now it's opt-out, and then you have to do all manner of difficult stuff to do it. And they shouldn't do that, but they do it because it's good for their business model. Um, oh, sorry, right here. I'm looking at your Yeah. It does. I, I have it on. I know it's on. I know, but I take it off all day. I put it on and take it off. I don't mind people knowing I'm here today, but I turn it off all the time. But I do it myself. It should, it, I do it. I turn it off and on. I turn it off and on. I know how to, but I know how to. And I know how to do it. Um, let me just ask other questions right here. And I'll go over here. Sorry. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, they're not, you know, it, it's interesting because I think Google was the biggest lobbying increase of all, like all of them are. They're all worried about different things. I think what would be, it, it would be interesting to see, you know, what's interesting is, for example, Elizabeth Warren's proposals or, you know, I think sometimes she's just saying them to start the conversation and she's starting it as 
we're going to screw you over here. But really, she wants to do this. This is my get, my assumption of what she's doing. But she is she's opening the conversation up for it. And so now that's the conversation. The breakup is the conversation and not whether we should, like, how should we break up is the conversation versus whether we should break up. So that's interesting. I think, uh, I, uh, unlike pharmaceutical companies and others, these companies aren't quite as good at being evil as, as the others have been over the many years. Um, and so they, there's a part of their employee base that doesn't like this, like what they're doing. And you see protests at Google, the Google walkouts. You're seeing protests at Salesforce, protests at Amazon, protests at all kinds of things. So they have a problem with an employee base that is not, uh, is not docile. They don't have a docile employee and they don't have control over their employees. Um, and so therefore you'll see they have to be very careful about the stuff they do because their own employees can walk out the door and that's their wealth. And so that's, it's an interesting juxtaposition. So far, uh, they've been very careful not to overstep, I've noticed. And I think it's due to the employee base. Um, but, you know, they try to buy them off with free kombucha and salads and dry cleaning and stuff like that. <laughs> These children will not be satisfied. So um, right here, right here, and then here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah. Um, there's we. I don't want Moss. I will find out if you give me your name. I'll find out because we had this on our site. We what we did is we put up when we had Walt was very obsessed with cookies. The idea of cookies. And so what happened when you came to our site originally? You could not use it without reading our explanation of a cookie and what it did. And then we gave people seven options to remove cookies and still use the site. Yes, nobody does that. I know. But I will find those links that Walt has and, and get them to you if you get me your email. Because there are ways to use the web without running into the... You can fake yourself, essentially. And so it, it puts you through a browser that isn't you, but they think it's you. And therefore, it lets you in to everything. Right, but you can go through an anonymous browser. I forget what it's called. I'm blanking on it. But there's a way for you to use a plugin on your browser that makes you a not, it's like a VPN essentially. It's a VPN, that's what it is. And so I think that's right, it would be a VPN. Well, there's a way to make them think you're you, you're, you're you without make, it's ridiculous that you have to do this, but yes, that's, there's a way to do that. It's, it's a fake, it's a fake you that isn't you. And then it all is gone. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> History. History. Look, Microsoft used to be the most evil. Look at right here. He knows. Microsoft tried to kill him, right? He's still wandering around. Um, but, you know, Adobe's doing pretty good. You know, it's uh, history. I think there's, I think innovation always ultimately wins. And, uh, you know, a power ultimately always screws itself by being, by overreaching. Um, I do think that if if there was enough of a threat to these companies that their behaviors needed to be modulated, they would modulate themselves. Um, I think the problem that you have with Silicon Valley people, again, all lovely people, is they don't. They I wrote a column about this for the Times. They they never took a humanities course in their life. They don't take ethics courses. Do they need an ethical officer? Do they need that kind of thing? And so I I, I, I don't say this to make a joke, but Mark Zuckerberg not completing college is a problem, like for all of us, because he's unfireable. He is un, he is, he controls that company. He can, he can only fire himself. That is really, the board is, you know, I had, I wrote, I'm writing a piece about how, what, why do we even have a board of Facebook? What's the point? They just have a nice dinner every quarter, right? Like who cares? It doesn't matter what they say. Um, and, and we're lucky he's not like the, you know, that boy in that, there was that twilight zone where the boy would look at people and they just disappear. He can do that to everybody, just so you know. And so I think, um, I think one of the things I try to use with him, for example, is shame and uh, how dare you. And it tends to work a little bit, but I would urge you to listen to my podcast with him about a year, less than a year ago. Because you'll begin to understand the mentality of these people. Um, there was an exchange. Most of the attention in that particular review got around the part where he said that Holocaust deniers don't mean to lie. 
which I've had a problem with. Um, and But he said it completely like, well, they don't mean to lie, Kara. And I'm like, yeah, they do mean to lie because they're anti-Semites. That's what they do. They lie about the Holocaust happening. Like, of course they mean to lie. They don't actually believe it. They're trying to... Anyway, they we had a back and forth about that, and that got a lot of the attention. Um, but I found that one of, the, one of the really problematic exchanges we had, and it wasn't hostile in any way, is I asked him about Facebook with its WhatsApp app created um, virality around the apps with thousands of people. That's what those, those riots happened because of the virality that they built into it, right? Um, and so I said, how do you feel about inventing something so badly that it created, it resulted in deaths of dozens of people? Like the way you built that was the reason, it was directly the reason for the riots. It was, besides humans being awful, that's, that goes without saying, um, it, they used this tool in a way that created a real frenzy. And so I asked him, I said, how do you feel? You made something that killed people. How do you feel about that? And he said, you know what? I'm an engineer. I believe in solutions. Solutions are my the name of the game of an engineer. And I go, yeah, I got that engineer. But the fact of the matter is you made it and it created the death. So wh while you want to fix it and move forward, let's look at what happened. Let's take a reflection on what happened so that we would know how it happened and therefore not do it again. And I said, that's what adults do. They look at the con what they did so they can fix it. We're not all toddlers here. And he said, well, you know what? I believe in forward movement. And I said, yes, but let's look back at what you did to create this situation. And it literally goes on for six things. And at one point, essentially, he's going, I just think about going forward and innovation. He kept doing that. And I was like, listen, you're the arsonist who burned down the house. I want to know how you did it so that you don't do it again. Or somehow I want to jail you. I don't know what I want to do, but something so that we can at least pick it apart. And what was interesting is because he's, as I said, he's a lovely guy. He couldn't even begin to entertain consequence. He couldn't entertain any kind of self-reflection. It's, it's, it's like it doesn't have the gene of self-reflection. And I think it's because he's never taken a humanities course. He's never faced any kind of lack of safety. Everything's been on an upward trajectory. And therefore, he's never felt the pain that his... I don't, I, I don't want to psychoanalyze him, but I think he just doesn't have the capacity to be making the decisions of for 2.6 billion people on this planet who use that thing. And so, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think we ju he just shouldn't be doing it. That's all. I think we need to get much more involved as a, a regulatory, as citizens, as everything else, the, the way things always get fixed like this. You know, Andrew Carnegie ran a lot of stuff that he doesn't, didn't end up running in the end. Um, okay, just, just a few more. Just, I'll do three more. Two more. Okay, two more. Uh, right here. And then right here. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. There, it's not going to work. But how do you think about the Trump administration banning end-to-end -end encryption? Bon chance, Donald. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry. It's just not, it's not, you know, Apple's not giving up on that one. I think they've got a lot of, it'll go through lots of things, but it's not going to happen. It's just, I mean, that was interesting because it was a fight during the Obama administration and people in the Obama administration were fighting over it. Ash Carter was against, Obama was for, Comey was the one who was really pushing it. Um, I just don't think it's going to, I just don't, it's, there's no way. There's, it's, he can talk about it. It's another talking point. I don't even think he understands what it is, so it doesn't really matter. But I don't think they, I don't think they have the, the um, it's just not going to happen. I'd, I'd be shocked if it happened. You know, we'll see. We'll see. Apple will fight it for sure. Well, that's another area that's getting disrupted. You know, Facebook is moving into Libra. Have you heard about Libra? It's their, it's their coin. They're making money now, which is, oh, Jesus. Like, I was like, um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I think it's really, I think the financial service industry needs to be disrupted. It's, it's one, two areas that haven't been disrupted by technology that much is healthcare, the delivery of healthcare and, uh, and, uh, and finances. And there's a good reason for the healthcare thing. There's a lot of privacy concerns. There's all kinds of things. It's a really, to let private companies run this is a problem, to have public organizations do it is a problem. There's like all kinds of issues. Um, but financial services has not, it is going to see an enormous change. 
I think blockchain has become just blockchain is going to affect a lot of things, but finance is obviously the first area it's been focused on. And away from Bitcoin, the concept of currency and how we buy and sell things, we're fine in this country because we credit cards work, money works, all kinds of things. You can transact really easily in this country. Most of the world, that's not the case. And there, there's the, the fluctuating currencies and everything else. And so a lot of what's happening, a lot of the innovations are happening elsewhere where they have a real need for these kind of abilities to transact. And so the concept of transactions, I think, is going to undergo an enormous change and remove gatekeepers there like you can't believe. And that'll be a problem because a lot of that is, you know, it's one thing if it's a dating profile. It's another if it's your money. It's another if it's your business. So, and it's also possibly prone to more hacking. It's, it, it, it's, again, an area that needs to be heavily regulated. I mean, looked, not heavily regulated, but regulated. In a, in a, I'm not a proponent of big regulation in general. I don't. I think governments always tend to overreach. Um, but in, in this case, they haven't done any. And so that's my problem with it, is that there's been zero regulation around, just even around privacy. Um, we should have a, a privacy bill with teeth. And I think other countries... Um, I'll end, I hate to end on a dire thing. I, by the way, I love technology. I really, I'm a huge user of technology. And I, I always say, I don't want to be the person on the beach when the Wright brothers are taking off saying, hey, they only, it only was two feet. They said four. Oh, that sucks. Like they flew. Like, come on. Like, I do believe in this. It, the idea, the, the basic ideas behind the original idea of the internet, which was to bring people together, I still believe in. I just think that, when it's, it, it's a public, it's, it's owned by the public and it's been hijacked by giant companies. Like it's only gonna, they don't, they can't do anything but wanna make money. And so therefore, when giant companies are in charge of our destiny, this, it, it's a problem. It's of something so critically important and they, they themselves don't get to innovate. There's not enough innovation. And so that's what worries me is the lack of what's, who's gonna create what's next. And my biggest fear, is that uh, a country like China, which is making very aggressive moves in this area, not just in China, but across the globe, making investments, uh, equipment, and stuff like that. That's my worry. It's like, we're gonna have, this has been a US Western democracy led internet since the beginning. And for all its problems, it's great. It's been great for a lot of people. And so my worry is that a more fascistic, uh, a more, a controlling, a more controlling central government kind of thing takes over. Um, dictators love the internet. Let me just say, they, Duterte uses it in the Philippines, Erdogan, and they love the use of it and control of it. And so you want to create a system that doesn't allow them to abuse it the way they've abused it. And so that's my, uh, you know, that's my worry. And as to, uh, tomorrow I'm writing about Donald Trump, what would happen if Twitter actually kicked him off? Like, what would he do? <laughs> Which I think is funny. He's going to go crazy. But I, you know, he's, they're not going to kick him off. They're not gonna, but I, my whole column is like, where does he go if he doesn't have this? But what my point I'm trying to make in this column is that governing has been absolutely changed by Twitter. Look what happened with the census question. The, the Justice Department lawyers listened to the Supreme Court and were doing the thing. And suddenly he tweets. And the government lawyer is like, I don't know what he meant. I need to find out. Like, what? Like, like, it's an astonishing thing. It was government by Twitter. It just, it, just think about that. Okay, that's all, you know what I mean? You have to think about that really hard. Do you want a government by Twitter? Maybe. I don't know. I like the Megan Rapino videos. I do like, that's what I like. So, whatever. <laughs> anyway, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>